So, so far we focused on those connective tissue proper. And in this picture, the human knee, we see a few examples. We see the tendons, which connect the muscle to the bone, and the ligaments, which connect the bone to bone. Both of these are dense, regular connective tissue. The other types of connective tissue here are cartilage and bone. These fall under the category of supporting connective tissue because these skeletal tissues exaggerate the supportive functions of connective tissue by providing the main framework of the body. And this video is just going to cover cartilage and next we'll cover bone. But first, of course, let's talk about sharks. This shark is from the class chondrichthyes. The prefix chondra refers to cartilage. The shark's skeleton is made completely out of cartilage. The other major class of fish is called osteichthyes. If you see the prefix osteo, this refers to bone tissue. Their skeleton is made out of bones like ours. Here is another creature that has cartilage where we have bone. For them, that cartilage is a temporary holding space for what will become bone as it gets older. Most of it will be replaced by bone, although some of it's going to remain for life. So we're going to see this reflected in cartilage's relationship to the skeletal system. Cartilage, like bone, resists compression, but unlike bone, it's flexible and resilient. That is, if you push on it and then ease the pressure, it bounces back. So cartilage covers the ends of bones at the movable joints for cushioning and also connects the ribs to the sternum. Cartilage there is going to provide flexible support as it does in keeping your airways open in the trachea. Add some more collagen to the mix for strength and cartilage acts as a shock absorber between weight bearing joints. Or add some elastic fibers and you have a material that will provide structural support that will also tolerate repeated bending. So all these cartilages have special properties but they all share some common characteristics. And as always with connective tissue it's specialized cells in a matrix. And the matrix is the important part. So these specialized cells are chondrocytes. The matrix is a solid rubbery matrix. So if the fibrous connective tissue we talked about last time is more like a tough fabric, cartilage matrix is more like a hard rubber. So this cartilage resiliency is due to its ability to hold tremendous amounts of water. Cartilage is not as rigid as bone, but it's going to resist compression. And when the pressure is released, the cartilage is going to spring back to its original shape. The matrix also contains a thin collagen fibers for tensile strength. But the ground substance specialized to attract and hold water really gives it the ability to spring back from that compression. And so for the specialized cells, there's two types of cartilage cells. Chondrocytes embedded within the matrix and chondroblasts found around the periphery of most cartilage structures. The chondroblasts actively secrete the matrix during cartilage growth, whereas the mature chondrocytes are located in a space in the matrix called a lacuna, which we'll also see in bone. Now cartilage is the connective tissue that's totally avascular, that is there's no blood vessels within the cartilage tissue itself. This is going to be key when we talk about the poor healing ability in adults when cartilage is damaged. So the chondrocytes within that matrix have very low activity and are adopted to low oxygen. The oxygen and nutrients they do get diffuse through that watery matrix from the surrounding perichondrium. This is where the blood vessels are located in that surrounding fibrous connective tissue layer. This is the perichondrium and they have two layers, the intercellular layer, which contains the chondroblasts, which is going to assist in growth and repair of the cartilage. And then there's the outer fibrous layer, which acts like a girdle to resist outward expansion when the cartilage is, is subject to pressure. And it's a dense, irregular connective tissue, and so it also helps attach it to surrounding structures. Not all cartilage has this fibrous layer, the perichondrium, but all share that characteristics of that hard, rubbery matrix, which will be modified by the presence or absence of certain fibers. So this brings us into the types of cartilage, all of them with chondrocytes sitting in a lacuna in an abundant extracellular matrix. The difference between them is going to be amount and type of fibers, and that is collagen and elastic fibers. So the most abundant type of cartilage is highland cartilage, which looks clear because the collagen networks are actually too thin to be seen under the light microscope. Highland cartilage is going to provide support 
through flexibility and resiliency. It's going to make up the articular cartilage that covers the ends of adjoining bones and movable joints. It also forms the cartilage and attachments of the ribs to the sternum and accounts for most of the cartilage found in the respiratory structures. It's also the type of cartilage that makes up most of the embryonic skeleton, as we'll talk about later. That articular cartilage, which caps the ends of bones and provides cushioning, also requires a slippery surface and so does not contain the perichondrium, that fibrous layer. So in those weight-bearing joints of your body, more strength is needed and so there's extra cartilage pads there. And these are more like a combination of hyaline cartilage and the dense regular connective tissue that makes up ligaments. So this is fibrous cartilage found in the menisci of the knee and in between the vertebral bones and in the pubic symphysis, that joint structure that connects the two sides of the hip bones. So these pads of cartilage act as shock pads in between the two bones, preventing bone-to-bone -bone contact. So while the cartilage matrix, as always, resists compression, that extra collagen fibers help resist twisting. And that last type of cartilage contains closely packed elastic fibers, which offer a supporting structure, but also tolerates repeated bending with the ability to return to its original shape. So just a fun fact here, you've probably seen what's called a cauliflower ear, especially if you watch a lot of MMA or boxing. And technically, this is referred to as an auricular hematoma because there's an accumulation of blood between the cartilage tissue and the perichondrium. The hematoma could stimulate new growth and formation of new cartilage and fibrous tissue, but the new cartilage and replacement fibrous tissue is often distorted and asymmetric. So to avoid cauliflower ear, you want to think about how to escape from a chokehold and also not to turn away from a punch in the face if you are worried about damage to your ear. On the other hand, this may result in a septal hematoma or in the hyaline cartilage of your nose. So those are the three types of cartilage, their locations, their general features, and next we're going to look at its close relative bone tissue. See you next time.